Welcome to Stuff You Should Know from HowStuffWorks.com. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark. There's Charles W. Chuck Bryant. And uh, let's see, we've got a couple of producers out there. We're in a new studio. We've got Will and Mangesh from Part Time Genius. It's like we all have our pants on. It's a, a that's weird. That's the weird part. <laughs> it's a it's a just a big family fest stuff. You should know. Yeah. Welcome, you guys. Thank you, guys. We're in this brand new studio. Isn't this exciting? It is it's exciting. Pretty yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. a little woozy from the <laughs> yeah. from the formaldehyde. <laughs> it's a lot like a science class. In yes, here. Yeah. it is. I think that's what happens in here at night, science class. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're making extra money to pay for this new studio. Mm-hmm. To fill everybody in, we're just doing like in-joke frenzy right now. Right. <laughs> uh, stuff You Should Know, or I'm sorry, How Stuff Works has um, expanded. We've got so many podcasts these days and so many coming down the pike that they've built out new studios. And we're using – this is our first time, but you guys have used this one before, right? Yeah, it's an awesome studio. So, Chuck, let's introduce these guys, huh? Okay. Well, Will is who you've heard speak. Mangesh is who you've heard laugh. (laughs) Titter, I would say. You do have a great laugh, Mangesh. And they are the – we should have a laugh off at some point, you and me. That's what I (laughs) – people love your laugh, right? (laughs) I've been told. I don't know. All right. Mangesh, go. (laughs) Oh, wow. That was really (laughs) sweet. It 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 truly is like on command. You need an applause (laughs) meter. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So these guys are the hosts of Part-Time Genius, and they just let us know that it is your – and co-founders of Mental Floss, many – Years ago, but yeah, today right. is your fir- one year anniversary. We have been at How Stuff Works for one year. Yeah, that is fantastic. Year. Congratulations. Yeah. Hopefully, Jerry will work in some sort of post production sound effect or applause or I should have the, yeah. the fanfare yeah. button. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, congrats. Um, you. And you guys, so you guys have been doing part time genius. Has it come out like three times a week from the get go? No, it was two times a week at the beginning. Okay. And then... And we decided we didn't have enough work. And we right. Thought, Why not <laughs> add right. another than mix? <laughs> there was... Uh, it was around the time of the eclipse, and we thought, you know what? We should have done an eclipse episode, mm. and let's just share some fun facts. And then the next week, we were like, you know what? There had been some really bad news, as there has been frequently recently. Mm-hmm. And so we thought, you know what? Let's do an episode on nine things to make you smile. And so most of our episodes are big questions where right. we ask a question like, you know, will we ever be able to live without sleep or something like that? And so we decided to start throwing in these bonus episodes where we do nine things about mm-hmm. whatever it might be, facts about Mr. Rogers or... Houseplants. Or yeah. You know, houseplants, the usual. <laughs> but they're still pretty robust episodes. They're like 20 minutes, yeah. basically, right? Yeah. So three times, three times a week, my Hat is off to you. I'm also <laughs> vaguely threatened by that because I'm worried well, that somebody's gonna be like, "Why don't issues? you guys put out three a week?" Yeah, we rerun a classic. classic. <laughs> I don't know if that counts because it's not extra work. You know what I mean? So I'm a little, a little nervous, but still, it's pretty awesome. We're so, just building up to get the classics. Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, right? That's right. So how did you guys end up at How Stuff Works? Because as Chuck said, you're you're the co-founders of Mental Floss. Like, I feel, feel like that's worth saying a couple more times. <laughs> like, yeah, Mental Floss magazine. Yeah, one did, that like a site we used and still use a still lot. Still use. Yep. Actually, we don't use it anymore now that you guys Yeah, have. did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's not true. I, I emailed them about a bug. I found a bug where, like, if you went to go put the, oh, wow. uh, like, the, in the like, easy reader format or whatever mm-hmm. on Firefox, it would bring up a different article. So I let them know. You and sent they them a strongly worded Floss. message? I did. <laughs> oh, those but bugs. I was, like, one degree separated from the dev team at Mental wow. Floss. <laughs> yeah, Josh emailed me, and, of course, we reached out to them, and they were very much appreciative. Fixed it that. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. It's a great team there. It's still obviously a great site, and... And uh, we love all the crew at Mental Floss. And we were just excited about what's happening in the world of podcasting. We'd been big fans of you guys for a long time. Thank you. And just knowing how much is happening in this space, um, we were eager to, to try something new when we were approached yeah. about the, the idea of coming here. So. And and we'd been doing Mental Floss. We've been talking about Mental Floss since we were 19. <laughs> yeah. You know? Like, like it's, it's been nuts. a long time. And, and we've done, like, so many fun projects, so many things, but... By the end of it, there, we were just managing so many people, you mm-hmm. know, and we weren't getting to do the creative stuff as much. Right. Yeah. And at least that's how I felt. Yeah. yeah. Totally. And and uh, when we started, like, you know, thinking about podcasts, it, it, it just really felt like how Mental Floss started, where it was mm-hmm. conversations mm-hmm. and it felt like intimate. And, and the way you guys have built such an amazing community of people who care and are so invested. And, and somewhere along the way, I felt like... Um, you know, Mental Floss was such a massive site that 
I didn't know the readers anymore. There yeah. were too many. And, yeah, and, and, and somehow, somehow, even though podcasts are huge, like, you know, you guys have millions and millions of listeners, like, they all feel like they know you. And and, yeah. and I, I we sort of missed that connection. Mm-hmm. The well, cat they, is truly in the cradle, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Very sad. With the silver spoon. <laughs> well, I'm glad you guys are here. I know Chuck is too, so welcome. Thank welcome you to the much. family. What? After a year. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, on our first day here, we, we talked about this previously, but, like, we, we went around the House Networks offices. We met everyone. We were in these, like, meetings and stuff. Everyone went home early. And, and, and we're but, still— Yeah, that's a staple. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> I mean, everyone works hard, but they also, like, get to spend time with their families, sure. which is amazing. Yeah. And uh, when we got in the elevator, we were like, where do they keep the jerks? Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> there don't seem to be any in this company. It was just so nice. Did you say, are crew. we the jerks? Well, yes, <laughs> yes. That's what I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little concerned. Oh, oh no. Oh, God, they needed jerks. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're here at the jerks. Yeah, store. that's one of the really cool things. <laughs> like, we, I think we differ from a lot of podcast companies in that way, in that we have all this great, like, talent on the roster. Mm-hmm. And we're also going out and developing cool stuff. Yeah. yeah. It's very cool. Yeah. Yeah. So so enough about all this. Let's talk about the show some more. All right? all right. You guys have like quizzes typically. You have lots of guests on. What are some of like the best um, questions that you've asked and some of the best guests that you've had so far? I mean, that's been one of the most fun parts about this is getting to reach out to experts in different things and even experts in areas that we didn't realize there were experts. You know, we got to talk to – America's only certified water sommelier. I mean, we always oh, hear wow. about sommeliers <laughs> in the world of wine and that there's an expert in the world of water that these fine restaurants reach out to and getting to hear the ins and outs of that. But it was Or like, Antarctica's like, poet in residence. Right, you know, right. It was wonderful. Uh, yeah. He or she's not allowed to leave, though, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, she eventually left, but uh, she did. didn't get to take a lot of hot showers when she was there. I can imagine. Yeah. She probably swam away, <laughs> made her getaway. We had a, um, a guest on recently, the, an author of a book called Wind. And it was about the science of perfect timing. His name is Daniel Pink. And he was teaching us about, you know, how much time of day affects all of us and helping us learn the – uh, the disturbing fact that we're all a little more racist in the afternoons. And it'd be just weird things like really? that where he was talking about staging these court cases where they have these kind of mock jurors mm-hmm. and they put them together. This was not on a real trial. That would be an unfortunate way to test this. And um, <laughs> they would test their behavior and whether they were more or less likely to convict someone um, in certain scenarios, and they looked at what happened in the morning and what happened in the afternoon mm-hmm. and had people of different races, and they were more likely to come down more hard on wow. uh, on someone of, you know, a different race in the afternoons. <laughs> so they all tired and why? A Was there any idea why? It, I mean, it really does have to do with our, our body clocks, our circadian rhythms. and, and Post-lunch grumpiness? I, it's, honestly, that's, yeah. that's, that's part of it. But, yeah, huh. the, the science of that perfect timing, and uh, we learned and we've changed our behavior around this a different fact that came out of that one was that uh, they've done a statistical analysis on teams that uh, do more high-fiving, high-fiving <laughs> and chest bumping and it said head slapping. I'm not sure exactly what that is. <laughs> head slapping is just dangerous. Mango slaps my head before every episode and Twice they an are episode. actually shown to win more frequently. <laughs> it <laughs> might be because they're winning so they're high-fiving like yeah. if you're losing you're probably point. not high-fiving. That is a good point. But it's just a lot of fun to have these people on that have studied such fascinating things. You know, we consider them the experts. We're not experts but it's a self thing for us. We get to sit back and learn from mm-hmm. people yeah. who know so much about so many interesting things. Yeah, we, we had we did a show on uh, rudeness and, and whether there's a rudeness epidemic and there's this guy, Danny Wallace, who wrote this great book and one of the facts he was talking about was that this mayor in uh, Cartag- Cartagena or uh, somewhere in Colombia, I think, mm-hmm. uh, he, uh, he fired the corrupt police force and hired a bunch of mimes to mock people as mm-hmm. they were jaywalking. Wow. And, and, and it basically shamed the, the city into being more polite. It was amazing. Or annoyed them into being polite. Yeah, yeah, either way, too. but I mean, yeah. I feel like mimes are an uh, underused career. They really are, especially as civil servants. <laughs> <laughs> There's also core. a rise in mime violence in Is Cartagena, there? unfortunately. Yes, that's right. That's right. <laughs> There's another study being done about how that could have happened. Well, uh, everybody out there, if you haven't picked up on uh, the idea that you would love Will and Mangesh's show, uh, all you have to do is go to their website. It's parttimegenius.com, right? Parttimegenius.show. We decided to show. take it to another level. Right, yeah. 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 Um, it, that's really, really um, forward thinking of you. <laughs> <laughs> or dot com wasn't available. <laughs> right. One on Josh, two. but we were really thinking about it. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, parttimegenius.show. Mm-hmm. You got the podcast archives on there. 
So everybody go check it out. Yeah, or of course, iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. That's right. Isn't that what we say? I think we say those things. Yeah. Yeah. All right, fist bumps, guys. That's right. <laughs> Wait, no, no, f- head slaps. <laughs> Ow. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, thanks, guys. It was good Thank talking you. to you. It's always a joy to hang out with those two, huh? I love those guys. They are truly good guys. <laughs> um, so, Chuck, we are talking about words today. Yeah. Specific words. hmm Historical words. Yeah. That people may or may not be using correctly. Correct. That people may or may not have really defined some of these instances. There's really no problem with them. But they're fun to talk about, right? Sure. It's that whole descriptivist, prescriptivist thing. You remember that whole thing we used to get into? Oh, boy. It's a trip down memory lane, isn't it? I think so. So, like, descriptivists are kind of like language is constantly evolving. Oh, sure, yeah. Just go with the flow. Prescriptivists are like, no, no. The language is language, and you're if you're using it wrong, you're wrong. Right. Um, like David Foster Wallace was a prescriptivist. Right. Like basically grammar Nazi is another way to put it, right? Yeah, uh, and I want to go ahead, and this is not on our list, but let's go ahead and throw decimate in there. Okay. Because um, that is a word that we used to hear from a lot when we said something was decimated, mm-hmm. and we would have prescript. which one is the? Prescriptivist. Yes, email us and say mm, decimate means you know, DESA is by 10. Mm-hmm. So reducing by 10% right. is what it means, guys. Right. And eventually I just started writing people back and saying, you know, the modern dictionary even says that it has now come to learn mm-hmm. decimate can just mean, you know. Laid away. Wa- yeah, laid away, wiping out. Like this this bush mail's decimated me last night. <laughs> It well it reduced you by probably more than ten percent. <laughs> <laughs> right, it depends. <laughs> depends on how much push mills was involved. But anyway, that's always been a gripe for me. Like even when it's officially changed its definition over time, right, and recognized as such, people will still get their hackles up. And I'm like, dude, it's usually a dude. Let's but yeah, be honest. but that's a prescriptivist railing against it. Well, yeah, and it's also like, come on, man. Like, I'm sorry, we're not using the 15th century <laughs> right. usage of the word. Right. <laughs> So, yeah, decimate. They got their tunic in a twist. They, oh, no, tunics technically. <laughs> right. So I guess this one is, I think this episode is kind of for the prescriptivists, if you think about it. I, I still don't know who's who. Prescriptivists are the ones who are, who you're talking about. The what are we? Prescriptivist pedant. Remember oh, okay. it that way. So we're not that. No, no. Okay. We're, we're definitely, we go with that to each each their own motto. Yeah, and this is, a, of course, another, we haven't done a top 10 in a while. No. But as everyone knows, <laughs> our top 10s are never 10. No. Uh, and it kind of occurred to me that's usually because some of them we just think are dumb and also because of time. Cause sure. Because the way we go, these things would be way over an hour long. We decimate the top 10 list. Well, yeah. Actually, yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's start, man. We're talking again. I don't know if we got this across yet or not, but we're talking about historic words that are, that come from history that are either used wrong or not fully, not not they don't really get across the original intent necessarily. Yeah. They've just kind of evolved over time, right? Right. And the first two kind of pair together quite well. Like they a nice do. like a nice wine and a shot of bushmills. <laughs> right? Oh God. I'm not even on a bushmills kick. I don't know where this came from. That is a little I haven't weird. had bushmills in a long time. Yeah, and it's not something you would normally shoot it either. Oh yeah? Or drop in a glass of cabernet. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I think people shoot bushmills. Yeah. Well, you people know who, probably shoot anything. You know who do? Hedonists. Very nice. Thank you. Very clever. So that's what, that's the first word is hedonism, right? Yeah. So uh, most people think of the word hedonism as, and, and they do mention in this article that there is a nudist resort in Jamaica mm-hmm. called hedonism, which I'd heard And of. there's hedonism too. I think there's more than one. Well, there's a lot of nudists. A lot of Got nudists. Got crowded on the, the island. I remember, remember when we did our nudist episode? Oh, yeah. Um, I ran across an article about like a swingers resort. I think it was hedonism. Yeah. And it was just like, it may have been a men's health article or BuzzFeed or something like that. But it was like, I went to a a nudist swingers resort and basically never want to have sex again. I'm so grossed out with myself and oh, really? humanity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not to say that that's hedonism. 
because they may eventually be a sponsor one day. That's right. Uh, but hedonism is – most people use that – throw that word around to equate with just the ultimate in like sexual slash uh, party debauchery. Mm-hmm. Debauchery is a great word for it. Drinking, fornicating, mm-hmm. orgies, o- o- fine uh, – Scented oils and and silken linens. Right. And <laughs> Being completely ruined. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that is – that's basically what most people think of with hedonism. It's like giving in to your every desire, especially yeah. carnal desires. Right. Um, even at great personal risk and without much foresight, right? Apparently that is not at all the case of what hedonism meant originally. But you can kind of see how it evolved over time. Sure. Because hedonism stems from uh, the Greek word for pleasure. Yeah. Right? Hedonia. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that originally the hedonists, it was an umbrella school of philosophy. I think we kind of touched on it in our Stoicism episode. Yeah. But it, it was an umbrella philosophy that basically said there's two things in life that are that you need to pay attention to and everything else falls into place if you are maximizing pleasure mm-hmm. and avoiding pain. Yes. Those are the two things, pleasure and pain. Maximize one, minimize the other. Yeah, but the whole thing is they don't say – nowhere in there does it say – and by the way, this involves um, orgies. Right. Um uh, charcuterie trays. Which is weird because we're talking the Greeks here. Well, sure. You know? Well, I mean, I'm sure hedonism, it it also meant that, but it didn't exclusively mean that. Gotcha. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, like, it could also mean uh, delights of the mind, intellectual pursuits. Right. Stuff like that. It even says altruism, which is, it's kind of funny to think about someone saying, like, I, I brought, uh, I bought groceries for my elderly neighbor. and right. It was a purely hedonistic oh. sensation came over me. <laughs> so you're such a hedonist. <laughs> but technically, back then, that could have been the way you might use that word. Yeah, and, and even more to the point, the hedonist said there is there's something you really want to pay attention to here. Yeah, you want to experience pleasure, but it is really easy for pleasure to turn into pain mm. or degradation mm-hmm. or addiction. And you have to bear this stuff in mind or else you're, you're, you're going to pursue pleasure at your own expense and yes. then you're not doing it right. Right. Um, there's actually this guy in the, I think, the 18th century, Jeremy Bentham. I can't remember if he was at Cambridge or Oxford. And we're we've talked about him before. Five million emails. Surely we have. But he was a, a fellow or a don or whatever of philosophy Mm -hmm. at this university that's still around. And every year at one of their annual banquets, they bring his mummified head out and put it at the head of the table. Mm -hmm. I think on like a wax dummy. So he's dressed as himself Mm -hmm. and they've got the guy's mummified head. That's how much of a revered philosopher he was. He came up with this thing called philosophic Calculus. Okay. It's basically a an that equation. Right up my alley. An equation, <laughs> right. This is pretty dry, but it's the whole point is is to pursue pleasure as much as possible right. and to avoid pain. And he said you have to consider things like the duration of the pleasurable event, the intensity, um, how certain it is, the fecundity, like is it going to yeah. spawn more pleasure afterward? Uh-huh. Um, the purity, will it actually devolve into pain? Um, the extent of it, which means how many people are are affected by it. Um, and if you take all these factors into account, you can you can run any experience or any decision you have in life through that and decide, nah, I'm not going to do this. Or, yeah, I'll have that bite of Cool Whip out of huh. the fridge. Does anyone still use that? Uh, I'm sure there's a few people out there that do. Yeah. They're very exacting. I imagine so. So that's hedonism. Yeah. Right? We took all the pleasure out of that pretty <laughs> quick. But that leads to another word that's misused frequently, Epicurean. Epicurean. Yeah, that's the thing that uh, nowadays you hear people use the word Epicurean. Mm-hmm. There are probably a lot of restaurants that have a name on some derivation of this word. Right. But it's tied into food and drink, like really fine food, top shelf wine mm-hmm. and food. If you have Epicurean tastes – then you were someone who concerned yourself with the finer things at uh, in the dining room specifically. Right. And I, 
it's not quite as much it's not quite as much identified with overdoing it as hedonism but no. there's um i think more than anything it's like you said it's it's the finer things but you might overindulge here or there yeah and if you use that word about yourself then you are probably pretty obnoxious yeah <laughs> it's people like you who uh, are needed at parties for other people to avoid. <laughs> uh, but the word, once again, from Greek, epicure, uh, came from the philosopher uh, Epicurus. Mm -hmm. And people, if you don't know much about the root of the word, you probably think that his whole deal was about food. Right. And that's not necessarily the case, but he was a, a hedonist. Isn't that right? Yeah, he was like one of the great hedonistic thinkers, but in the ancient Greek sense of the word. Right. So his whole his whole deal was ataraxia, which was inner tranquility, and that you should pursue pleasure by just being content rather than going off and getting like wasted or eating a bunch or something like that. Yeah. That and that if you did have desire, it was better to eliminate it than satisfy it. But it was but if you did satisfy it, you should do it thoughtfully or mindfully. So really he was kind of the opposite of what people who consider themselves Epicureans were. Yeah, but also didn't he have a lot to say about uh, following your own path when it comes to that? It's like it was very oh, yeah. very centered around the self. Yeah, so good point. You do whatever you what whatever is best for you in the moment and not necessarily what uh, someone else thinks might be the best thing for you. Right, but again, the point is, is virtue, um, like value hedonism, like doing things that are actually good right. and that produce good rather than um, I'm going to shoot this heroin even though my my significant other doesn't want me to. Yeah. That's that's not what it was about at all. It yeah. was – Moderation. You have to find what gives you pleasure in life mm -hmm. rather than looking to other people. Look inward to yourself. Right. But yeah, moderation was a huge part of it. Yeah, and what I couldn't find – and that was the case with a few of these is where it got all wrapped up in food. I couldn't either. Um, I think it was people like food. So it just sort of, <laughs> yeah. That's all I can think of. I couldn't find, I was really hoping that around. there was like a turning point mm -hmm. where it was like, this is where it happened. Right. And there were a few places where I couldn't find that kind of thing. Yeah. It's just not out there. It's lost to history. All right. So we're disappointed. So we're going to take a break. Go put our heads together. Pull ourselves together. Turn our attitude around. We'll be right back. Burning stuff with Joshua and Charles. Stuff you should All right, we're back. We're going to stick around in ancient Greece for a little while longer. Hey, why not? I mean, they've produced a lot of misused words. Yeah, I they, got frankincense all up in here. You like frankincense? I don't even know what it is. It's a it's a um, resin based incense. Yeah, I don't I don't think. Have you smelled it? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I was raised Catholic. Oh, is that a, is that a thing? You ever been to a Catholic mass? Mm, nope. So they they'll go through with like this big incense burner and just. Dink up the whole church with frankincense. I've seen that in movies. And they're well, that's what they're doing is burning frankincense. And it's actually pretty pretty good smell. Now the only Catholic uh jams I've been involved in were sadly a couple well wine tastings? No, a funeral uh and a, a wedding or two, maybe. Maybe four. Well, it seemed like four. Four weddings and <laughs> that was close. Uh so cynic is the word. Did you already say that? No, I didn't. Okay. Cynic is the word, and this is one – I kind of like this word as we use it today because mm -hmm. I uh, try to abandon cynicism in my own life, mm -hmm. and I'm pretty turned off by cynicism as a whole. Yeah, okay. Which means in our usage is – like a, a cynic to me is someone who's uh, who's always suspicious. Mm -hmm. Suspicious? <laughs> of what's going on. Like, what's oh, your yeah, angle? That, yeah, like that person's doing something seemingly pure, but yeah, I'm cynical. So I wonder what that's all about. Right. That can't be true. I saw a great um, definition of cynicism in the modern usage. A cynic is a person whose faded belief or curdled trust had left him unfit for attachment to others. Whoa. That's a, like a, that's a deep cynic 
definition. Yeah, that's pretty heavy. But yeah, it can be a little lighter than that. It could just be somebody who's not willing to just kind of go with the flow and take things at face value and be happy about things. Trust other people. Yeah, trust, I think, has a lot to do with it. Right, agreed. So this is one of those words. I actually kind of found where this one turns, which we'll get to in a second. But it, it's based on, so cynicism, again, is a is an ancient Greek philosophy. Mm-hmm. And the cynics were not like the hedonists at all. They actually thought that pleasure was to be avoided. Yes. That if you're going to lead a virtuous life, you basically need to, needed to be um, take a vow of poverty, um, eschew any comforts or pleasures, just basically be a bit of a jackass, really. <laughs> kind of the idea of like, you, you know, the guys who like walk around and whip themselves. Yeah, self-flagellation. Uh, right. That would have been a very cynical thing to do in the original sense of the term. Yeah, and our own article brings up this guy. Uh, apparently, he was a pretty notable cynic. Uh-huh. Uh, Diogenes. I think Diogenes. Diogenes of Sinope? <laughs> I don't know if it's Sinope or Sinope. I bet it's Sinope. Okay, we'll go with that. It sounds nice. So Diogenesis of Schenectady. <laughs> right. Dianetics of L. Ron Hubbard. Uh, he, was, uh, he was one of these guys that would, uh, and they, the example that he's in here, he would he would go barefoot in the cold weather right. just to like acclimate his body. And, and his, his friends would just watch with their arms crossed and shake their head like, what? A yeah, jerk. but he would also bark at them, right? And say yeah. that you need to be doing this stuff. Like you and your luxurious things right. you need to be more like me. You like that wine? You're a loser for drinking that wine. You're a loser for enjoying it. That was his thing. Yeah, you should be a cynic. Right. And he was definitely not one of those go along and get along types, right? Doesn't sound like it. So maybe that is a little bit where it evolved from. It certainly he certainly seems to have taken cynicism to the extreme. One of the one of the legends of this of cynicism is that um he was at a banquet once and he was, I think, kind of telling everybody what jerks they were for enjoying themselves. Yeah. No idea who invited this guy. Yeah, what a buzzkill. But they, yeah, but they threw bones at him like he was a dog. Mm-hmm. Like, here, eat these bones, enjoy yourself for once. Uh, maybe they were saying, I'm just paraphrasing. Yeah. But um, th- he said, all right, I'll show you what I think of your bones. And he peed on them, which th- this whole thing is just taking like a violent, weird turn. Violent? And we still haven't gotten to the root of where cynicism came to be understood as as how we how we use it today. So do you know? The best I could find was that it lies in the 18th century with Rousseau, who was a critic of the Enlightenment, mm-hmm. who was, from what I understand, the embodiment of modern cynicism. He couldn't just trust that the Enlightenment and rationalism were the way to go yeah. and that it led to good things. He was a huge vociferous critic of the Enlightenment. And I think was either self-labeled a cynic or labeled a cynic, and that was the modern use of the word. Haven't seen it everywhere, but that's the closest I've found. Man, ancient Greece. How'd you like to hang around there for like a week? I don't know that I would. It just seems like such a crazy time. Yeah. And that all these deep thinkers and philosophers, and then, hey, let's go— Put these 14 people in a room right. with some farm animals. And some feathers. And see what kind of party we can have. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I guess I want to take that back. If I ever got the opportunity to travel anywhere in time for a week. <laughs> Since I, I would... mentioned the farm animals, you're like, wait, 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 I, think of it. <laughs> I hadn't thought about the farm animals before. It just seems like a really crazy time in our history. For sure. Man. But almost like it's like it took place on a an, an different planet. Yeah. You might as well have been like, ancient Greece was on Pluto, actually. Yeah, but so many things. I mean, and that's not even th- thinking about, like, the arts and sciences mm-hmm. and mathematics. It's just like, what a weird, amazing time. Yeah. So we're going to go fa- – we're going to fast forward a little bit in history. Okay. So far, we've generally been hanging out in the uh, fourth, third, second century <laughs> sure. BCE. It, it would take a few hundred years. <laughs> Now we're going to go to the 19th century, right? We're going to go to um, the antebellum south. Yes. Which is where, surprisingly, the term cakewalk came from. Yeah, and this was, remember when we used to blog? Yes. This is a blog post. I don't need to tell you that because you wrote it. Yeah. And then sent it to me yesterday. Right. (laughs) But I'm telling everyone else out there, we used to blog like everyone else did in the early 2000s. Yeah, we had a blog. 
And uh, this is one of Josh's posts, and I had no idea. You didn't you're... read the blog post that I wrote? Back then? Yeah. No, sorry. Uh, but this had has weird racist roots. When you hear the term cakewalk, everyone uses it now to say something that's super easy to do. Absurdly easy. Yeah, oh, it was a cakewalk. Like you just basically show up and you you win the prize. It's a cakewalk. Right. It turns out that that's actually extremely denigrating to um, – antebellum slaves in the 19th century because cakewalks used to be an actual thing. Yeah, this is distressing and weird yeah, to me. It really is. And especially that you can trace the evolution of the word for once. Yeah. All right. So here's what would happen uh, on a plantation. And how often did this happen? Was it, I would guess it was annual. It seems like something like that. Mm -hmm. So let's just say once a year, every so often, uh, at the plantation, the white folks would get together and they would throw a big ball like they would throw for themselves, mm -hmm. but they would have the slaves play the part of the white people. And actually, it was a ball for the slaves. Yeah, but it wasn't, you know, like, here, let me reward you right. with something nice. It's, hey, dress up as us. And we'll all sit back and laugh at how you think we are. Right. And you do your best impression of of slave master. Right. And kind of entertain us. Right. In a mocking, jeering way. Right. Like, have you heard of, well, I know you have Saturnalia, mm -hmm. which is like, a again, a Greek, I believe it was Greek, maybe Roman um, festival where social conventions were turned upside down. Yeah. And the masters became the servants and the servants became the masters mm -hmm. for like a day. And the whole point of this was culturally, socially, that it actually reinforced social norms because, yes, the slaves in Saturnalia and then the slaves at the cakewalk were mocking the, the social conventions that they had to live in the other 364 days a year. Yeah. But they were doing it within a socially prescribed framework that was really overseen by the people in charge. So, yes, yeah, I mean, they, they were forced to do it. Well, they were allowed to do it, I think, is the yeah. way, you know? So, so it actually, in a really weird roundabout, but very, very real way, reinforced the social norms that, that kept slavery afloat. Yeah, and I don't think we mentioned the reason cake mm -hmm. comes into it to begin with is whichever couple uh, – in the cakewalk, did the best job mm -hmm. and was able to uh, mimic the white people the best, got a cake as a, as a prize. Right. So the cakewalk was an actual thing. And the story actually continues on a little further, and it gets even worse, to tell you the truth. Um, those cakewalks, they happened at, on plantations in the South. And so if you went to a cakewalk— you were probably one of a very few number of people, especially outside of the South, who yeah. had been to one of these things. But the minstrel shows that led to the vaudeville shows in the 19th century, um, they would actually very frequently perform a cakewalk. But the cakewalks they did were basically um, making a mockery of even the mockery that the the slaves were undertaking, right? Yes. So, at the very least, you could say of the cakewalks, the, the real ones, the slaves were most likely they meant the mockery that they were doing, right? Even though they were allowed to mock it, they still meant it. Uh -huh. the, the reason the minstrel shows were so horrible is that it was a cakewalk. It was a, a, a staged version of a cakewalk mm -hmm. making fun of the cakewalks. So it even removed and robbed from the slaves that little bit of agency that the cakewalks gave them because it was white minstrels in blackface. Right. And Imitating the, white people. Yes. Right. So the – but the, the whole premise of the minstrel show version of the cakewalk was not that the um, black slaves were mocking white society, but that they were actually doing this because they really wanted to – to emulate white society, but we're failing miserably at it. So it was a really despicable and disgusting change, conversion yeah. or perversion of the original intent, which was already pretty messed up to begin with. Yeah, just just one of the many problems of minstrel shows. So, right. So the idea of cakewalks, since more people saw minstrel shows than actually were at a cakewalk, right. this was the idea of the cakewalk. So when people said this is a cakewalk, the idea was that even if you were just 
clumsy and inept and could never hope to succeed at, at what you're trying to do, yeah. you could still win the cake. Yeah. That was the original usage of the word. So what I can't gather is, is this a term now that like people just shouldn't use? Or has it changed such that it's not like a genuinely offensive thing? I don't know. I don't think there's too many people out there that take offense to it. But I wonder if that's because a lot of people don't know what the origins well, of the word sure. are. Not many people probably know this. Who knows? But you can also make the case that the use of it today is actually ageist because yeah. cakewalks are normally found in nursing homes. Really? Yeah. I never heard that. And the the couple's promenade is replaced with musical chairs. Mm -hmm. And even even in even in these these competitions of musical chairs, everybody's still basically a winner. I wonder if piece of cake comes from cakewalk. Yes, it does. So is it's a that piece on the list? of cake. <laughs> Interesting. I think we just covered it. Maybe I'm going to start saying it was a total piece of pie. Right. There you go. Easy as pie. Well, there you go. Where did that come from? Uh, it was probably somebody who knew what cakewalk meant and wanted to change things a little. Or I wonder if that came from the fact that pie is generally easier than baking a cake. I don't know if that's true, is it? I think so because there's not chemistry like – you combine some apples and cinnamon and stuff and throw <laughs> it in an oven, you got a pie. There's a pie maker who just like threw their iPod across the room. Like a pie is not going to fall because you didn't put just the right amount of— That's a good point. You know? Yeah. It's easy as pie. There's no Lady Baltimore pie, I'll tell you that. I think I'm, what I'm saying is pie makers, you need to step up your game. Sure. Try a cake. Try baking a cake. Unite and take over. <laughs> I love pie. We've had this talk. I like it all. I don't see any reason to—, to choose no have both um should we move on should we do kafka-esque yeah sure all right so franz kafka very famous writer this is i did not know that a lot of most of his works were published uh, after his death i didn't know that either uh but he had a knack for writing books and i read the metamorphosis in high school but mm -hmm. it feels like most of his books had a central character that was going through some kind of like walking through molasses, some really hard struggle that they have no control over, probably have no hope of solving. Right. And uh, a lot of times it, it was, a an, I guess, an allegory for an oppressive government. Yeah, almost always, right? So yeah. the, per, the person is being their, – their forward progress or their life or whatever it is they're trying to do is either interrupted or – um, being opposed by some faceless, immutable yeah. entity, typically in the form of like a government or uh, an office or something like that. Yeah, like the movie, uh, mm -hmm. the Terry Gilliam movie Brazil mm -hmm. is probably accurately described as Kafka-esque. I would guess that's absolutely right. But but Kafka um, wrote, he's very well known for the trial, the metamorphosis, mm -hmm. um, but he wrote so, – a lot of a lot of the different uses of Kafka esque actually work because they definitely touch upon some of his different work, right? Yeah. So one of the uses of Kafka esque that came into fashion supposedly in the 1960s in Eastern Europe, as the Iron Curtain fell. Um, well, the Iron Curtain fell before that, but as as the the faceless centralized government bureaucracies like really yeah. kind of put their stamp on on the lives of all, millions and millions of people, apparently the word Kafkaesque came into use then yeah. to kind of describe having to deal with these absurd bureaucracies that made zero sense but still could just shuffle you around for days on end if it wanted to. Yeah, and then the our article uses a good example that it started getting misused and that somebody might say that they uh, raced to catch a bus – and then got to the bus stop, and they made this great effort to get there. Mm -hmm. But then they find out wah, wah, there's a bus uh, driver strike, right? And said that that was Kafka esque, when in fact that's just bad luck. It is. It's. It's. If that's the worst thing that happens to you that day, you're probably doing or, or okay. just life, right? But that's not Kafka esque. No, it's not. So um, that that but. But that's not to say that there is a central definition of Kafka esque. It is a a pretty wide. Um, widely defined or multiply defined word, which yeah, I although like. This guy does a good job of describing it, I thought. Yeah, he did. Uh, there's an author named Frederick Carl with a K, and apparently in the New York Times, he said this, uh, what's Kafka-esque is when you enter a surreal world 
which all your control patterns, all your plans, the whole way in which you have configured your own behavior begins to fall to pieces when you find yourself against a force that does not lend itself to the way you perceive the world. You don't give up. You don't lie down and die. What you do is struggle against this with all of your equipment with whatever you have. But, of course, you don't stand a chance. That's Kafkaesque. And that's Brazil. Especially the last part, too. It's like you don't stand a chance. But you still try. You still try because, yeah, what are you going to do? Just be like, oh, okay, well, I guess I'll die. Yeah. You still try to save yourself or to 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 follow your self determination, but you you're never going to win. You're doomed from the outset. Yeah, that is super Kafka esque. That that dude, he was his biographer. Oh, I believe. Well, that makes sense. So he's kind of an authority on him, right? He knows. So doomed, in other words. Uh, you want to take one more break? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, we're doing that right now. All right, Chuck, now it's time for one of my favorites on this list. Yes. Luddite. I got called this a few years ago. By who? By my friend Scotty. Oh, Scotty, come on. This is more than a few years ago, but I'm ashamed to say I had never even heard the word when he used it. Yeah. No, I can't remember what I was complaining about. Really? You hadn't heard the word Luddite, huh? Had never heard it. I mean, this wasn't like six months ago. This is like five or six years ago. Right, right. But he called me that, I think called me that, or maybe Emily. Did you go, what? Uh, I think I was like, well, I'm not a Luddite. And then I like <laughs> raced over and looked it up or something <laughs> <laughs> nice. on my smartphone probably. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, so I, people throw that word around to mean uh, anyone who's anti-technology basically right? is a Luddite. Yeah, a lot of people throw it around. Apparently um, Prince Charles railed against GMOs famously. Yeah. He was called a Luddite. I know Franson um, – just talk mad trash about Twitter. Johnny Franzen? Yeah. <laughs> on, I think on Twitter even, I can't remember, but he was called oh, a Luddite. Well, come on. I don't remember how it played out, but I'm pretty sure it was on Twitter. Um, but yeah, any anybody who is like, um, like, like uh, we use, I was just getting used to like Google Docs and all of a sudden we're using Basecamp around here. And I think you called me a Luddite, didn't you? Or an old man, one of the two. Mm, no, I called you an old man. Okay. But you could have also said you're a Luddite. <laughs> the thing is, is this is one of those words that has evolved to basically mean the exact same thing as a technophobe, right? Somebody who's yeah. afraid of technology, either because they don't understand it or they're worried it's going to lead to the end of the world. Right. Whatever the reason, new technology makes you nervous. Correct. Right? That is such a generally accepted definition of this word that for all intents and purposes, it is um, – it is the definition of Luddite. The thing is, is if you dig back in history, this, this is totally wrong. Yeah, Luddites were people from ancient Greece. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no, they weren't ancient. Who loved farm animals. <laughs> they, were, uh, they were from Nottinghamshire. I love that word. England. And they were weavers. So what was beginning to happen, and you can see how it got its roots here, is mm-hmm. automated looms came around in the early 19th century during the Industrial Revolution. And they were like, wait a minute, this puts our jobs at risk, so we're not going to take it. Like Twisted Sisters will eventually say. Right. We're not going to take it. And they would go, like, trash these looms. Yeah. And they named themselves or they took the name or they were they were named. I'm not sure how it panned out, but they were called Luddites because decades before, and I think 1779, a guy in the same area named Ned Ludd <laughs> Had trashed like a hosiery, a, a hosiery frame. Yeah, yeah. Ned Ludd, <laughs> too many, too many D's and too few other letters. Yeah, agreed. Um, he trashed a hosiery frame, frame and became kind of a a, a hero, a working yeah. class hero for doing that. And the thing is, is yeah, you can get the the idea that these people were afraid of these automated looms, and it was they were really afraid of technology. No, that is that has zero to do with it. Yes, it turns out that looms had been in use for hundreds of years already. This is not really new technology. Right. Which is a kind of an ironic thing about the whole thing. What they were, were, it was class warfare is what they're engaged in, not anti-technology um, terrorism. 
Yeah, they were – they wanted to keep their jobs. Right. Uh, there was a ban on u- trade unions. So they had no – well, let's say they had no choice. They felt like they had no choice mm-hmm. rather than to go out and riot and trash these looms. Right. Um, but they – they – they used all sorts of technology to do so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I saw that the the to these people, to the Luddites, the looms were a con- they they symbolized a concentration of wealth because mm-hmm. they didn't own the looms. Somebody they worked for owned the looms, yeah. and that they weren't seeing anything from they weren't reaping any benefits from these looms. So when they were destroying a loom, they were striking at the loom owner. This, this wealthy person, which is why it was such class warfare rather than anti-technology rioting. Yeah, and it wasn't, I think, until the 1970s that Luddite became uh, kind of the more modern usage. Is that right? So I found – so this this thing the sev- says the 70s. There's actually an article in New Scientist that used the word in 1970. But okay. apparently there was a famous essay called The Two Cultures by a um, scientist named uh, C.P. Snow. And he basically said – we have a problem here because literary intellectuals and scientific intellectuals are beginning to diverge, and you literary intellectuals, you guys are basically nothing more than Luddites. Yeah. And this is 1953, and I think he might have been the first person to use it to mean technophobes. Oh, 53? 53. Wow. Or in this case, I think he was saying, like, you don't understand what the importance of the Industrial Revolution so people sat on that for 17 years. Yep. And then New Science was <laughs> like, oh, the time is right. Let's bring it back. Yep. All right, that's a good one. I like I, that one. I, that's that's my favorite. These are kind of like uh, I think a few of these you could throw around at your next dinner party and uh, either uh, make people think you're interesting mm-hmm. or that you're an obnoxious jerk. It depends on how you present it. Agreed. You know? Yeah. So what else we got here? I don't know. You want to do two or one? Let's do – well, let's definitely do Nimrod. How about that? Nimrod. <laughs> this one confuses me because of that Pixies song, Nimrod's Son. Oh, yeah. So Nimrod actually did marry his mother. He had a mother wife for a queen. But he was – that's not what he was known for. No, there was a real Nimrod in the Bible. Mm-hmm. And Nimrod was – if you've ever heard of Noah from the Bible, mm-hmm. this Noah was uh, the great-grandfather of Nimrod. Right. So he had, he had quite a pedigree. He was Ham's son. Ham. Yeah. <laughs> we don't use that as a first name enough these days. Yeah, I hear it as a last name sure. occasionally. but like John Ham. Yeah, with two M's. But you never hear like, hey, I'm Ham Johnson. Good to meet you. <laughs> that would be a great name for a sportscaster or a weather person. Or Ham two Johnson. podcasters, the Hamcast with Ham Clark and Ham Bryant. That's not bad. That's good. That's our spinoff idea. And we threw around that word a lot in our Ham Radio podcast because they're called Hams. Right. Maybe that's what our Hamcast could be about. How nice ham radio operators are. As well as bad comedy. Right. And then every once in a while we review a ham that we eat on air. Dude. You just figured it out. Look at that. I mean, you predicted Sharknado. <laughs> All right. The ham cast coming soon <laughs> at iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. So Nimrod is ham's son. He is a, bi- a biblical figure. Mm-hmm. He was very well known as the founder of Babylon. Yes. I didn't realize that. I'm not much of a Bible scholar myself. Really? No, not really. Um, but he was he was the founder of Babylon, and one of the big features of Babylon was the Tower of Babel. Yes. This one I did know about. Yeah, the Tower of Babel is what he was credited <laughs> with uh, constructing, and that was a structure on top of a temple with mm-hmm. the idea that you could reach God ultimately and destroy God. Yeah, and push him around. Yeah, so not a good thing for uh, ancient Christians. No, so God was like— um, I can kind of see into the future, so I'm not going to let that happen. Yeah. And he goes, um, different languages, Shazam. And all of a sudden, the people who are building and constructing this Tower of Babel can no longer speak to one another because they all speak different languages. Yeah. And this is supposedly the origin story of different languages, foreign languages in the world. So everybody, since they couldn't really communicate with one another, went off their separate ways. And this is another one. Where they don't know for sure where it made the switch eventually to be like a a dum dum, but I think this Bugs Bunny, yeah, I think this holds water. It definitely has some legs. It tracks. Uh, Looney Tunes, Bugs Bunny, nineteen forties. Mm-hmm. Shout out to our friend Jessica. Oh yeah, whose uh, grandfather was Noah. <laughs> was Chuck Jones? 
That's right. The greater great Bugs Chuck Bunny. Jones. So uh, Bugs Bunny in one of the Elmer Fudd episodes, who was a hunter, mm-hmm. um, called him Nimrod in an episode. And I don't think we said Nimrod was known as a great hunter. Yeah. I guess that the irony was lost then. Right. Yeah, they're <laughs> so like, like he was a oh, hunter. I get it. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know if they put Nimrod in there because Nimrod was a great hunter or if it just worked out that way. But I, It had to have been. Yeah. Had to have been because that was the thing. That was Elmer, Elmer Fudd's whole thing. He was yeah. just terrible at hunting. But that's what he was always doing was hunting, right? So we called him a Nimrod. Right. And I saw that the, it came into use as slang among teenagers in 1983. Yeah, that seems about right. Does it really? Oh, it feels like a very 80s. I heard that a lot growing up. Really? Yeah. To me, it seems really square in like 50s. Oh, no. I'm thinking like, yeah, I hear Nimrod and I think Grody to the max. And like pop collars and Lacoste alligators. Did you ever pop your collar? Sure. I always, I never felt like I could pull it off. I was a bit of a prep. I was too, but I just, I don't know. It never, I tried it. I looked at myself in the mirror a lot. Well, that's the key. You with can't the do that. Collar. You just pop the collar and go out the door. Yeah, I didn't have that kind of confidence. <laughs> Still don't. <laughs> you get the you get done with your Floby cut, pop uh-huh. your collar, and go. Yeah. Yeah. It has nothing to do with confidence. It's just foolishness. I was thinking the other day how I haven't touched a hairbrush since like 1987 or 8. Oh, yeah. Literally have not put a brush or comb in my hair. Did you have one of those goodies tortoise shell brushes from the 80s? Remember those? No, I had a goodies, and it wasn't tortoise shell, but I think it's probably the same thing mm-hmm. where, uh, yeah, it had to have been. Or the burnout comb where you had it sticking out of your back pocket? No, I never, I never really used combs. I was a brush guy for, to get my wings down. Gotcha. Uh, but ever since high school, it's, I've just been a finger comber. Yeah, same here. These these uh, these five fingers. Yep. <whistles> See I get, that? I get out of the shower, <whistles> just kind of spike the hair up, and it stays there. Yeah, it's nice. It's very lucky. You don't use product. No, nah, man. That's insane. Are you kidding? No. <laughs> man, my hair won't stand up. It's just limp and lifeless. Well, mine is too. I don't wash my hair much. How often do you wash your hair? Every day. Oh, well, that's your problem. Oh, well, there's your problem. There's your problem. Man. You got a little, <laughs> got a little, little funk buildup. I need a little funk, I guess. I My product is natural funk. Go party with some farm animals. And I think that was a George Clinton album. My product is natural funk. It, oh, it's nice. <laughs> should have been. It, sh- it definitely should have been. And now, because of the Sharknado thing again, that's his new comeback <laughs> album. Uh, you got anything else? No. Well, if you want to know more about George Clinton, you can type his name into the search bar at HowStuffWorks.com, and it'll bring up something. And since I said something, it's time for listener mail. Uh, I'm going to call this uh, vaping backlash. Oh, yeah. We're hearing about it. Yeah. It's nice to hear the vapors stand up and be like, hey, dudes, to heck with you. Yeah. So in retrospect, I think we kind of made fun of them a little too much. <laughs> you think? Yeah. In retrospect, sure. So this is from Peter. So this is a mea culpa then. Well, sort of. Uh, hey, guys, usually enjoy your work, which is – that's always a great start. Yeah. But the vaping episode, come on, guys. The whole episode reeked of mockery and belittled all vapors, even the ones who were simply using it as a harm reduction method or to quit smoking. I'm 51 and used uh, e-cigarettes to quit smoking instantly and permanently, mind you, about eight years ago. It's the only thing that worked for me. All I can do all day is puff flat, fat clouds. Your research was seriously lacking in this one. Uh, you would have been much more informed if you actually talked to a vaping advocate. I want well, to I want to interject here. Our research was not at all lacking. We did a ton of research for this episode. Please go on. Well, we tried to get in touch with vapors, but they were all out on the sidewalk blowing back clouds. Right. Or at least someone on the local scene, guys. From this century, preferably. Ooh. Uh, things have come a long way in the last 10 years. Some of the facts he uses in quotes. Uh, you were citing were based on seriously flawed research. For example, the vape, uh, vaporized metals particles portion. Was brand new. Nobody, nobody, he says, would vape at the temperatures needed to replicate that in the real world. Um, but as usual, people see the headline and don't dig deeper. Uh, this guy's starting to really upset me, Chuck. Yeah. Really? Yeah. We researched just as much as we ever do. Buddy, what's this guy's name? Uh, we'll get to that. 
Okay. <laughs> we did get called out, though. A couple of other people I, said that those temperatures, like, you don't vape at those temperatures. No, but you can, and some people do. Okay. And I, if I remember correctly, the leaching metals thing was not about temperatures. It was about the newness of the coil. Okay. I feel like I'm a I'm refereeing. <laughs> I know. Uh, calling people stupid and dummies for vaping at zero nicotine levels. Mm-hmm. Smack my head. There's more to cigarette addiction than the nicotine issue. I think vaping could potentially eradicate smokers from our society, the very least save thousands of lives and millions of dollars in medical and pharma. To paint it all with the idiotic foolishness brush is plain wrong and a real disservice to uh, to your audience. Uh, I'm pretty pissed off, as you can tell. (laughs) There are only, I'm sorry, sure there are people who vape that make us all look silly, but man, this is the only smoking cessation method that works for many people. You just turned a lot of people away from it who could really benefit and possibly not die. Disappointed listener here. That is from Peter Joet in Vancouver. Peter. Peter. I will totally agree with you. Our mockery was way over and be above and beyond. Yeah. We yuck yum. Totally. For sure. And I apologize. I want to make a couple points here. We definitely, definitely did our research. We don't just phone episodes in. It doesn't matter what we think of the topic. Yeah. We still do our research. And then secondly, I really don't feel like we turned people off of vaping and onto tobacco. Because if I remember correctly, we definitely made it clear yeah. that you were even dumber if you smoked tobacco. The tobacco was far, far worse. I think the whole point of that episode was that vaping was not necessarily as good for you as it's been portrayed in the same media that you railed against earlier. I would agree with that. I don't think we, I think we poo-pooed all forms of nicotine. We definitely did. So there you go. But I mean, if you're using it to get off of tobacco, that's great. Step two is getting off of the vaping. Yeah. Uh, Well, if you're like Peter and you're PO'd about something, you want to get in touch with us, you can tweet to us. I'm at Josh M. Clark. Chuck's at Movie Crush. uh, And we're both at SYSK Podcast. Chuck's on Facebook.com slash Stuff You Should Know and slash Charles W. Chuck Bryant. Uh, You can send us an email to StuffPodcast at HowStuffWorks.com. And as always, join us at our home on the web, StuffYouShouldKnow.com. On this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. 